Wonderful to see all of you. This is the kickoff of our first ever Women Tech Voices programming. And so let's give a round of applause. That's, that's worthy of applause, right? So at 1871, uh, many of you do, are many of you part of employee resource groups or have been part of employee resource groups in your past? We have, oh, there's Disha. Hi. <laughs> the person that you got the presents from is right there. Wave, yeah. Disha Galati from Here, Here Market. Um, we have what we call community resource groups, which are led by members of my team, but are for the whole community because my team is small, but the community is big. So we have Women Tech Voices, Latin Tech Voices, Black Tech Voices, and Pride Tech Voices. And this is the first ever convening of the Women Tech Voices group. And um, yeah, I'm really excited. And uh, affinity programming is really is at the core of what 1871 does. I mean, we are here to inspire, equip, and support founders and leaders who are building extraordinary businesses no matter where they are. And that includes people that are literally leading those companies and people that are on those teams. Does anybody know what the percentage of female founders is in Chicago? And my team cannot answer. <laughs> it's too low, but it's not as bad, but it's better than most. Number? Jess, you remember? Who said 30? All right. Did you know? Did you hear that from me before? Or you just no. knew that? Yeah. <laughs> so it's 34% 34, 34 in the city of Chicago, and the national average is about 18%. So yes, too low, but really, but Chicago is doing great relative to the rest of the country. Of the founders that are here at 1871, of which we have somewhere in the 450 range of early stage, meaning somewhere between I have an idea and I've launched, 50% of those are non-white, um, and they're from all over the city of Chicago, Chicago land, and so we're really energized by that. Um, before I bring up the panelists, which is just an extraordinary group that I've been, we've been trying to get this group together for, for a year, and I'll give you a little bit more of the backstory in a second, I wanna thank my team, so Jessica Prath, Olivia Thompson and Alicia Aubrey Bercy, they're part of the Women Tech Voices group. Let's give them a round of applause, please. We've got our events team, uh, Lydia and Daniela. I don't, they were at the front desk. I don't know, have they made it into the room yet? No, so if you'll see them, you can, you can thank them. We've got Red here and Martine from our operations team. I see Thomason and Robbie and Emily and a bunch of other folks are, are floating around. And so not, the world doesn't spin on its axis without Team 1871. So thank you for all, for all, of, your, all of your work. Uh, we have our Women Tech Founder Cohort number 17 is kicking off on April 16th. That might apply to some of you and it might apply to people that you know. And so please encourage them to apply and reach out. If you wanna know more about that program, find Alicia Aubrey, where are you? She's right there raising her hand. She can talk you all the way through it. Okay, in a second I'm gonna bring up the people that you actually wanna to listen to tonight. Three of my friends, people I, I feel very lucky to call friends. In fact, um, you know, at some point in your life, may, some of you might feel this way, you kinda of feel like you're, you, you know, you've got your friends. You don't really have room for more friends. Like you can meet more people, but you don't really have time for more friends, you don't have room for more friends. But these three women that you have the pleasure of learning from tonight, I count as my, like, real friends, like truly, tr like friends that I got at after age 50, like friends. <laughs> so friends, uh, two of whom whose daughters are my babysitter. So, uh, not my babysitter, uh, <laughs> Charlie's, my son's babysitter. So we're gonna have a really great conversation. As I bring them up, we'll talk for about 30 minutes as a group, and then we're gonna pause and we're gonna bounce it out uh, to, to all of you for the questions that you might have. And so please join me in welcoming Sandra kodrova michik the President and CEO of WTTW, Shavri Humphrey, President and CEO of the Museum of Science and Industry, and Megan Ross, President and CEO of Lincoln Park Zoo. <laughs> All right, so where I wanna start is th these three have just tremendous personal stories. So I'm gonna allow them to do their own introduction, in their introduction, tell a bit of their leadership journey to where they are uh, today. And so you can start from whatever point you want. Think of it as like Jewish minutes, okay? So Megan, do you wanna start? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, thanks for having me, Betsy. Uh, Jewish minutes, when I was a little girl, I'm gonna start <laughs> way back. 
I was one of those kids that loved animals, and I thought animals were amazing, and everyone thought I would want to be a vet. And then I would take my dog to the vet, and my dog hated the vet. And I was like, why would I want to be that job? That sounds terrible. I like animals. I don't want to be the thing that all the animals hate. And then I, you know, went to school and had no idea what to do with that because everyone who worked with animals was veterinarian. And then in college, I went to a, a talk and this woman stood in front of the room and was talking about that she was studying macaques in Indonesia and she listened to their vocalizations and she watched their behavior and she wrote stuff down and someone paid her. And I still, to this day, feel a little bit like, that's a job, someone <laughs> does that? That's what I do with my free time. So um, that was a really transformational experience for me. Um, I didn't know how to get a job uh, after that, but I ended up surreptitiously meeting someone and then getting to go to graduate school. And in graduate school, I did a lot of work around the world, and then I ended up being called by Lincoln Park Zoo and asking to be the bird curator here. And now I've been here for 24 years, and I've had a lot of different roles, and I've been the CEO for the last two years. So two minutes, I think. <laughs> and uh, you're a mom? Yes, I am a mom. I have a 19-year-old son who is a sophomore at Butler University, and I have a 17-year-old daughter who's a junior in high school. Mm -hmm. Who survived the birthday party at the water park for eight 11-year-olds recently. <laughs> so we're, we're an energetic 11-year-olds, yeah. I heard, yeah. And what is your favorite animal? I get asked this question a answer. lot. Okay. <laughs> I know the answer too. Just okay. My favorite animal are flamingos, and it's not because they're pink or that they're, you know, have these cool legs. But I love that flamingos do everything together. So flamingos have these uh, dance things, these dance behaviors that they do as a whole flock. So 100,000 birds will all participate in it. And the reason they do this is so they can synchronize when their leg, eggs are laid, so their chicks will all be the same age, so that no one has an advantage. And it's all a adaptive okay. strategy. So if a predator comes in, you really hope that your chick's not picked out. It's like a you know, survival of being in a big pool. So yeah. Amazing. Thank you. Yeah. All right. See, isn't that cool? Yeah. yeah. For all these three, every time I'm with them, I just learn so many fun, fun, <laughs> fun things because their jobs are so much different than mine. All right, Sandra, let's hear your story. And now when I see flamingos, I think of Megan. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Every, it's true. Every time you see um, a flamingo. Yeah. Okay, two minutes. So um, where do I start? Okay, so I'm originally from New York. I was born in New York City. I am the daughter of Ecuadorian immigrants, um, which is not always apparent to everybody. And um, I sort of grew up, you know, navigating, figuring out, okay, what is it that I want to do? I thought I wanted to be a journalist when I went to school. I studied journalism um, at Syracuse. And I graduated and I realized that there was this whole bigger, broader world to media and then eventually business. And, you know, I, I went to, I was at Turner Broadcasting for a couple of years and did fun things like, licensing for Scooby-Doo and launching Cartoon Network and working at CNN and sort of got that, um, that foundation. And then again, I sort of had this curiosity about this bigger, broader world. Went to business school, worked internationally, ended up moving to Silicon Valley during the early days of the dot-com boom. I say that and now I'm totally dating myself. <laughs> but a decade in Silicon Valley, uh, you know, at places like Yahoo, and again, places some places don't exist anymore. Um, but I always sort of stayed in this media, and I would say marketing path. Um, I sort of built my career through media and marketing, and um, what I found along the way was you end up finding people that you work with that you really enjoy working with, and so. There were a couple of us that moved to different companies together, like three or four different companies, not intentionally, but we sort of found each other multiple times at different places. So um, I think there's a lot to be built on sort of that relationship building and being curious about more than just your little sliver of the world. Um, so I've lived in lots of different cities. I think I've lived in seven different cities, worked in international and different countries, and um, have been in Chicago for eight years or so, maybe nine years, and um, have been with WTTW and WFMT, which don't forget about the WFMT side, right. yep. classical yep. music, um, yep. which I do love. And so a lot of these things came together. I was a public television kid. I grew up on Sesame Street. 
you know, my family spoke Spanish. Nobody spoke Spanish except for, you know, Maria and Luis <laughs> on Sesame Street. So, um, so here I am, and, and, you know, I enjoy it. I love what I do. It's nonprofit. It's media. I'm lucky enough to sit on the PBS board. So, um, yeah, so this is how I ended up here. And also a mom. Yes, also a mom, um, two teenagers, um, which, by the way, when I went back into television and I told my son I was going back into television, he said, you couldn't have gone to work for ESPN. <laughs> <laughs> but then he said, oh, wait, Wildcrats, right? They're cool. It's OK. Yeah. So I got my credit back. Bar, yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Chevy, tell us your story. Um, well, my story started um, when I was a kid and I kind of it, in my DNA, um, my parents, I grew up in an underrepresented community, and um, my parents bused me to schools outside of my neighborhood, and I was that kid that felt guilty. I felt guilty because I was getting this incredible education from these affluent neighborhoods, and the kids in my neighborhood weren't getting it. And so um, when I get home, I'd hold school in my garage, and I'd invite all the neighborhood kids over to, um, to, to come and learn, and every time they learned, I'd give them a toy. And so um, my mother always said, you know what, you're gonna be a great fundraiser, and you're gonna be a great person that's gonna give back to your community. And so that sort of stuck with me my, my, my whole, that stuck with me my whole life and, and, um, and growing up. And so I took a job um, while I was in school, and it was with the Houston Symphony and I really loved math and I loved numbers. And I would sit at the desk and the CEO used to walk by my desk and ask me, you know, where are we gonna end up for the weekend? Where are the numbers? And because I love math, I was always right. And so I gave him the numbers. And then one day um, I had the courage, I said, hold up. And I thought all of my team members were gonna fall out of their chairs. It was like, she told the CEO to hold up. <laughs> and I said, you know, Every time you come by my desk, you're asking me what the numbers are, and I'm right, and you're taking it straight into that room with all your bosses, which are board members, and he goes, yes. I said, well, if I'm doing that, I could do what you do. <laughs> he, goes, he goes, yes, you can, and that's when I decided I wanted to be a CEO of a nonprofit because I did my homework, and I said, you know what? I'm going to get the best of both worlds. I'm going to run a business just like a for-profit company, but I'm gonna take their earnings and give it back to the community, which falls in line with my, um, my, my DNA and, and my beliefs and my values. And so I look now at uh, MSI and at the work that I did in Arizona, and I'll, I'll go back to that story, but I just have a bigger garage to, to, to actually embrace all of these youth to actually inspire them to be the best and, and, and follow through with their dreams. Um, but I took a risk to be a CEO of a nonprofit. In um, Houston, I had a mentor that told me that I would never become a CEO of a nonprofit because of my color and um, because um, it just the, the community just wasn't ready. And he was a really nice guy, and he was right. Um, and so I decided to take a, take a risk. I took a job in Phoenix, Arizona, and the only person I knew was the person who hired me, and I was a single mother. And I drove across the country in the car with my daughter, and I said, we are going to do this. And, um, you know, uh, eight years later, actually, no, nine years later, um, I became the first CEO of, the, of a science center, uh, first black American to ever run a science center in the United States. And so um, I realized that dream, but I also um, realized how important it was to be a role model for my daughter and for all of the young people to say, if you dream it, you can do it. If you can see it, you can be it. And so that's sort of my story. Amazing. You recently received your doctorate. Thank you. Oh, I have to tell you a funny story. So my mother, when I told her I was going to be CEO, I took care of my mother for 13 years before she passed away. And so I said, Mom, I'm going to be a CEO of the Arizona Science Center, the first. And I went through all this thing. And she looked at me. She said, your sister's a lawyer. <laughs> and I go, huh? She goes, I don't know what you do. I guess it's important. But, you know, I always wanted a doctor and a lawyer. So I got a lawyer. So I actually just finished my doctorate 
for my mother. <laughs> and you're also a mom, and well, you've mentioned, and a grandma, right? Yeah, great. All right, so one of the interesting parallels between all three of their journeys is that they all, when they took over as CEO, they took over after somebody that had been in the role for two plus decades. decades. So the CEO of MSI, WTTW, WFMT, and Lincoln Park Zoo had all been in the role for 20 plus, plus years, 30 years, 20 plus years, 20 plus years. And so, and you came from the inside, mm -hmm. and you, you two were hired from the outside. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, like, how do you even think about that transition when you're, not to mention all the three pre predecessors were male, you're all female, but outside of even gender, how do you start to think about how do you come in and take over after somebody that's been there for that long, culture, team, you know, challenges that you face that maybe weren't addressed before? Can you just, just jump into the mix, start share your stories? Yeah, I think mine's going to be a bit different, so I'll jump in on mine. So as I said, I've been at Lincoln Park Zoo for 24 years. I started as the bird curator. My predecessor had started as the bird curator in 1976. That's when he started at the zoo. So he had been there for 46 years when he retired. Um, and I didn't want to be a CEO at all. I was a scientist. I loved my job. Um, and he thought that he saw something in me and kind of invested in me. And he signed me up for a leadership program that I did not sign up for. <laughs> And, uh, and then informed me that not only had he signed me up for it, but I had been accepted and that I was going. <laughs> um, and so I took that, it was an executive leadership program through the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. And I believe in saying yes when opportunity um, presents itself. And so I was like, I will say yes. And this will be my year to figure out if this is for me or not. And so I really invested in myself that year to decide if I wanted it or if I didn't want it. Um, and then I decided I did. And I was very fortunate that the board at Lincoln Park Zoo also was investing in me. And so I was a part of a six-year succession plan at the zoo. <laughs> Um, it was a very long time uh, to be in a succession plan, but you know, I, during that time, became the zoo director, so I was running all of the operations for a few years before um, he retired, and uh, I had already, and I built my team while I was the zoo director. <laughs> so I had the very good fortune that when I started as the CEO, I had already been running the zoo for several years and running it through COVID, and then already had my team established by the time I started my CEO role. Yeah, terrific. Yeah. All right, Sandra and Very Chevy. different experience. <laughs> um, when I got a phone call uh, about this role, I was not looking to make a move. I was not looking to make a change. And um, so I originally said, no, I'm not interested. And then six months went by, got the same phone call again. They said, let's have a conversation. Because what I discovered through the process was the board members that were doing the search, there were five of them, were amazing. They were committed to finding um, something different that could set the organization up for the future. They were not looking for the person who had just been in this role for 27 years. And they were looking for innovation and change and outside perspective and different experiences and all of those things. So I, d I didn't come in knowing, I didn't know anyone. I didn't know the staff, I didn't know the predecessor, I didn't know the board members before this recruiting process really came in cold. But the fact that they valued that perspective, and they came from all different backgrounds, and they were serious about the process. They really, the questions they asked, all of that, it made me feel like, okay, they really are committed. and. To me, that's what made the difference. They were committed to the mission, of course, but they were committed to setting you up for the future, not you, me personally, but the organization up for the future. And um, so I came in and had to do a full assessment. Who do I have? What do I have? What do I need? Um, you know, the, the whole fundraising process. I mean, from beginning to end, and you know, long time tenured people, which there's a lot of really great things about that. They're also, 
you know, times to bring in new. So it was a build, rebuild, build on what was already there. It was a combination of all of those things. And, um, and we're still building. So that's how I would put it. Awesome. Chevy? And I, I, have the, I didn't say this in the opening, but I have the privilege of serving on Chevy's board. And so I've watched her as she's come in and, and really transformed MSI. Well, thank you. I've had both experiences. Um, when I was in Arizona, um, my interview at Arizona Science Center was with the CEO, and she says, where do you see yourself in five years? And I looked at her, and I said, your job. <laughs> and she looked at me, and she says, well, if you do this, this, and this, um, then I'll train you to be a CEO. We shook hands. And, um, but I knew that the, 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 there was opportunity. And um, I applied for a program that was only for CEOs. And I put in my application, I'm going to be a CEO. And um, they actually took me in. I was the only CEO, they, they non-CEO that they took in. Uh, the woman asked me in my interview, she goes, well, this is for CEOs. Why are you here? And I said, I'm going to be a CEO, so let's get this interview going. <laughs> and uh, what, I, what that program was, was a, a sabbatical that actually actually got to design, and I went and did a SWOT analysis of my skill sets and myself to say what was I good at, what were my weaknesses, what were my threats, opportunities, and I designed this whole sabbatical based on that alongside the CEO, and it was a woman CEO who was a founder of the museum, and she said, I'm going to train you to do this, and the board, um, it was a succession plan, but it wasn't a given succession plan. And so normally as a CEO, they would give you a five-year contract. Well, they are like, well, she's never been a CEO. It's cheaper to keep her. Let's do this because the institution needs stability. They gave me a three-year contract. Went home, told my mother, and my mother goes, well, you got to do, do that job in two and a half years. Somebody normal would take five years, so you need to get it done in two and a half years. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. She was right. So we did. We made all of our goals in two and a half years, and that's that was that 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 succession plan was successful with as a CEO. But the hardest part is that a lot of the people that I worked with, that were my friends that I grew up with, and that in the organization, um, they weren't the right people in the right seats. And so I had to make some tough decisions. And as a CEO, you have to make the tough decisions to move your organization forward. Um, so let's speed it up to um, three and a half years ago. I got a call um, during COVID um, from MSI, and I knew the CEO, David Mosina, who was my predecessor. We actually had a CEO group that we put together. We called it our own YPO of uh, science museums. Well, we didn't like any of the other members, so it was just me and David who met. <laughs> and so me and David would just meet. So I knew all about MSI and what was going on. And... And then, um, you know, I got this call um, about MSI, but I knew I did want to call David because I didn't want to put in a conflict of interest. And I'm like, no, I'm pretty happy where I am because, I mean, I had it really good in Arizona. I had, um, we just built this institution up. It was great. I said no four times. And then finally, I don't know if many of you know Allison Ranney. She's uh, with uh, Russell Reynolds. <laughs> she called me and she said, Chevy. Every CEO in your field is looking for, looking to, you know, applying for this job, and they're calling you. Wake up! <laughs> and I scheduled a meeting, and um, I decided to, to to actually come talk to them, and went through the interview process, and didn't talk to David at all. And um, when they offered me the position, uh, then I called David. And I said, David, I'm coming to take your place. He says, About damn time. <laughs> <laughs> and at the end of the day, David and I have this incredible collegial friendship um, that we continued because we were in the CEO group together where we didn't, uh, we, didn't, we didn't care for a lot of the people, so it was just us. And we still have those conversations. I talk to David probably once a month. Uh, we have breakfast. I talk to him about what's happening at the museum and what do you think. He tells me what he thinks. He tells me what he, what he wants me to hear. I changed the office. He goes, why did I think of that? I said, because you're different. And we, t we go back and forth. So it's a great relationship, and uh, the connection is amazing. So I'm very blessed to be in the city. He had skill sets of understanding Chicago, being in the part, heading up transportation, working under uh, uh, Mayor Daley, et cetera. I came here with science museum experience, but not the city of Chicago and the politics. 
and all of the things that go into it. And he's helped me navigate through that. Um, and he said, he said, don't screw it up. And we just have a great relationship. So um, I'm very fortunate and blessed. I, I think what's amazing about that story is you, you it, it, perhaps in different contexts, you could, you could hear very different stories. But what I heard was, for, from each of you, a huge level of support for you from the board, from the team, from external resources to help you get going. Now, obviously, you haven't all had perfect days. We, we know that, right? Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if, as you think about the change management that you've had to lead, if you could think about the theme around innovation. You've all mentioned it in some way, shape, or form, but how does innovation show up in, in, your, in your agendas inside your team as we sit at 1871, the you know, the land of innovation here. Yeah, I can talk about that a little bit. It's funny yeah. you said don't mess it up because I had someone tell me the exact same thing and he's like the founding father of public media. It's Newt Minow, if you recall Newt Minow who recently passed, but um, that whole idea that there's a responsibility, right? So you take that responsibility very seriously and then when a problem comes your way, you're like, oh yeah, I'm the one responsible <laughs> for making sure that it doesn't get messed up. So when COVID hit, I, I have to use that as an example because um, you know, people were not coming to the office and they were you know, changing the way they worked. And you know, we're a media organization, so media doesn't stop. So there are people who never left. If you worked on Chicago Tonight, you were in the studio every single day. And so we were still trying to do productions and shoot and you couldn't walk around on the streets. So we said, okay, well, Jeffrey Bear is our local sort of tour guide, right? He does boat tours, he does all those kinds of things. Um, we did a drone show. So the entire show was shot via drone. Cool. So again, this was like, could we really do a drone? Is anyone gonna watch that? But, but you know, figuring out, like, we still had to produce high quality content and what do we have at our disposal to do that? No one had really done that kind of thing locally before, and so we said, why not? And it, we continue to play it, it streams, it gets an audience, so you, you're sort of forced into that sometimes. Again, I go back to because of the responsibility. Yeah. Like you have a responsibility, <laughs> so yeah. that's an example. No other choice but to figure out how to make it happen. Yeah, you have to, to figure it, it out. Happen. Yeah, Chevy? Um, you know, I, I would just say, um, to have innovation, you have to have the right people in the right seats, and you have to you know, hire people with the ability to dream, but also give them enough leeway to fail <coughs> and support them um, um, you know, all the way through the journey. And that's something that I really believe in, and I also believe in hiring people that are smarter than me and being humble enough to know that they're smarter than you, and that's why you put them in the position and let them do the work. And don't question, don't micromanage, just let them do it and support them. And so um, that's the team, that teams I like to build are people who are gonna challenge me, people that are gonna be my truth tellers, people that are gonna care about the institution and we're all one team trying to strive for the same goal with different lenses through seeing the, seeing the problems through different lenses with different perspectives. And so that's where I see the innovation. Um, an example would be um, when I was in Arizona when COVID hit, um, most uh, science museums were struggling. They had to, you know, lay people off. They had to stop their program and et cetera. I split our team up into the optimists and curmudgeons. <laughs> and I said, you know what? You're optimists. I want you to talk about all the optimistic things you can do in this business. Curmudgeons, I want you to tell us everything that's going to go wrong. And they came together and built a plan. And in two weeks, we had a digital platform that was serving parents, that was serving students, that was serving teachers, and that we were still delivering our programs online almost immediately. We bounced back from COVID in June before I left. I left in um, December. In June, we were already back to normal. And we were all, our, we repaid all the salary losses, et cetera, during that, that couple of months of COVID, and it's because we were, we were innovative, but we were, we were willing to be scrappy and agile um, to be able to find a solution. And so I take that same practice and those learnings, because when you're under the gun and when you're under pressure, you have to make stuff happen. And we don't have any money, 
You have to figure out how you're going to get money. And so you have to make sure it's our problem, not your problem, our problem, and how are we going to get out of it? And so that's how I look at leading teams and um, leading innovative opportunities and changes within an organization. And so when I came to MSI, we were closed. I mean, who starts a job when you're closed? I mean, I walked in, no lights were on, and I went to the boiler uh, technicians, and I'm like, okay, what do you do? I'm Chevy. How are you doing? And... And I learned so much from the people that were actually in the trenches so that when people came back, I had a perspective that I probably wouldn't have had if it weren't for COVID. Mm -hmm. um, and in addition to that, I didn't know anybody in Chicago. And so I said, you know what? I'm not gonna stop. You know, all these people, when they come to their positions, they have all these parties and people introduce them on the North Shore and other places. And I'm like, well, I'm not gonna have all that. So what am I gonna do? I, I asked one of my team members, they said, we'll just get on Zoom. I had over a thousand meetings my first year and was able to listen to people in the community and hear what they had to say and took that data and built a strategic plan based on those voices. And the team helped me do that and they were innovative to help me see things that I heard in different ways and we developed our strategic plan for the next 15 years. Amazing, Megan. Yeah, I'm gonna take a different um, so uh, I'm a scientist and I really like doing very nerdy science things um, and when I started at Lincoln Park Zoo we had three scientists at the zoo so now we have 40 scientists in the zoo wow. and the reason we've grown so much is because we've had as we like to call them visioning sessions we have regular visioning sessions and I've been in charge of the zoo's visioning sessions since 2008 and I'm about to hand it off to somebody else to be in charge of those because I don't need that additional role but those visioning sessions are we bring people from all different levels and we have a topic or two and then we talk about if we didn't have any limits, what impact would we like to make? And so that's how we've created, we now have six science centers at the zoo and that's how really all of those started. So we have the Urban Wildlife Institute, which started in 2005, and now 50 cities around the globe collect data the same way that we do. We started collecting data here in Chicago to understand how urban wildlife are navigating the city of Chicago, and then other cities heard about it, and now cities around the globe are actually joining our network so we can all collect data the same way so we can figure out how you create the cities of the future where wildlife and humans thrive. Um, I had a visioning session where we were talking about how we study the animals in our care. So I'm a behavioral scientist, I study welfare science, so I like to watch animals, look at their behavior and figure out what their needs are. And you do that by seeing what they're enjoying, seeing the things they're avoiding. And so we developed an app called Zoo Monitor. Um, we developed it for Lincoln Park Zoo in 2009. And over the course of years, other zoos have seen that we've had this app. We made it free and available. It's now used at over 700 institutions in 70 different countries. Um, and it's all using science to be able to say how you can care for that animal and what your management decision is doing for that animal's welfare and how it's affecting their behavior. And then we're taking a lot of the information and data that we, I could talk about all the science that we do at the zoo, um, but we take a lot of the things that we're doing to try to make sure that the animals have, as a welfare scientist, when you have agency in how you spend time your day, you feel happier. So welfare, you can think of happy, and the continuum of happy, poor to happy is your continuum of welfare. And so we've been really recently talking about how are we gonna give more agency to the animals in our care? We can passively use Zoo Monitor and see what they're using and construct habitats based on the behavior that they're showing us, but now we're starting to use, and we've been using touchscreens for since 2004, but we use touchscreen computers with four species and we're asking them things like, do you want a carrot or do you want a grape? Do you want asparagus or do you want broccoli? And truly giving them agency, and now we're trying to figure out how to make that for all the species at the zoo, where they can, we can provide the habitats, but we could say, do you want to be with Betsy, or do you want to be with Sandra today? Do you want to be in this habitat? Do you want to be in that habitat? Asparagus and broccoli are nutritionally equivalent. Which one do you want? Because we know that that's actually going to be a, an agent of change for welfare for those individual animals. So those are three examples that are kind of long ago, not that long ago, and then more recent. But we regularly have those. We have... <laughs> 
somewhere between four to six visioning sessions every year. And sometimes we have a whole visioning session and we sit down and we're like, this is a great idea. And it goes nowhere. And sometimes we end them and we're like, yeah, none of these feel great. And sometimes we build a whole center around it. So that's how we kind of use innovation and try to transform what we're doing. Yeah, I think that's terrific. Uh, do you remember one of the very few first questions I asked you? Um, the first question of how did you get to where you no. are? No, not today. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> what? Which question are you talking about, met. Betsy? It hasn't been that long. <laughs> My first question I met with I met when we met was, can I hold an orangutan? <laughs> and you said, no. <laughs> and, um, and, but a lot of it was about, I only bring it up just because of the whole theme around agency and how you aren't, like, th th that you don't have those kinds of experiences at the zoo because you need to give the choice to the, to the animal. Right. It's, well, it's dangerous. It's so dangerous. we'll just go ahead and throw that out at and the beginning. Dangerous. But um, <laughs> also, <laughs> yes. I'm going to hold an orangutan. Yeah. Yes. Okay. We're not allowed to. She's but. like, trust me, you don't. <laughs> you do not. Um, and also, it compromises their welfare. But also, we've done studies where we know that if people are in the same space as animals and you see a visual picture of it, we are now doing studies where we know if you see that, you automatically assume that that animal is, it significantly de decreases your thought on their endangered status. So, for oh. example... Chimpanzees used to be in commercials. Maybe you remember chimpanzees being in commercials. Lincoln Park Zoo's done a lot of advocacy work to actually retire the whole industry. Yeah. And that is because we realized that people used to say, orangutans, gorillas, they're endangered, but chimpanzees are not endangered. And we asked them the reason why, and they said it's because we see them in commercials. And that actually affects our conservation efforts. So if people don't think that they're endangered, they're not going to invest in their conservation status. We just did another study where we looked at sloths, and if you're, and sloths and pythons, if you're between the ages of 18 and 30 and you see a person with a sloth or a python in a picture, if you're male, you think, and you're 18 to 30, you think that they make a great pet. If you're female between 18 and 30, you think a sloth makes a great pet. And ever since there's been some viral things that have gone out about sloths and having people have sloths in their space. Um, and ever since then, the poaching of sloths has exponentially increased. Oh, wow. And so we're really trying to figure out what are these drivers, because we're doing a lot of work in the space of mitigating yeah. illegal wildlife trafficking. That's one of our other science centers. So. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. That was a long answer. No, no, I, I appreciate it. I, no, I appreciate it. I think, um, appreciate it. All right, I'm going to ask one more question, and then we're going to bounce it out to all of you. And the question is, you, all three of you lead really, really important institutions for the city of Chicago, and Chicago's cultural tapestry is pretty unique, and the role, the, the, the civic life of the business community here, I think, is unique. You have experience working in other cities more than Megan and I do. And so um, can you talk about how you think about your role in the city of Chicago, both as a leader, but as well as your institution and, and your, your sort of commitment to the, to the city of Chicago? Yeah, actually, one of the first meetings I had when I started this role, Newt Minow again, told me I need to go see the woman who runs WETA, which is the Washington DC PBS station. And she said to me, I'm from Chicago and I hope you know what you have there. And I said, well, what do you mean? And she said, the philanthropic community, the civic engagement, and that sense that everybody has to play a part in the success of Chicago, for all of Chicago. She said, I hope you know what you have there. And it just reinforced for me the role that, not just me personally, that I have to play in the civic community, but the role that the organization plays in the community, right? Whether it's PBS Kids and doing programs in libraries, which we do every single week, or it's focusing on homelessness, which is a huge issue in the city, or um, the role of journalism and democracy. Like, big weighty big. things yeah. that we have to be having these dialogues in the city of Chicago. And it means that it's almost like it adds to your job because then it's like, you don't just get to have your own board, you have to go sit on a board and you have to go sit on three other boards. And it, like that involvement, I think is unique in Chicago, that responsibility that people feel to have it be successful. Yeah. So I, I see it every day. Yeah, amazing. Chevy? Um, 
much to add. That, that's, I mean, you hit the nail on the head. Uh, coming from a community in Phoenix where um, a majority of the people are transplants from other places, we get a lot of Chicagoans, we get a lot of people from New York, all over. Um, that sense of community uh, isn't always there. And um, coming to Chicago, it was amazing. During my interview process, every person that interviewed and talked to me talked about their responsibility in this community. And it was very heartwarming to me, but it also was a huge, it was actually scary because it was a huge responsibility that, you know, being a steward of one of these large cultural institutions that I needed to give it 200% and, 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 and do my all and build a team that could help us continue to build on that. So there's a huge responsibility as a leader to, to actually have a higher engagement and higher impact in the community because people love and care about the museum. And so um, I just feel blessed to be a part of it. Um, I don't take any of it for granted because this community is quite amazing. And um, you know, every day I wake up and I'm just excited and, 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 and my team is excited to do the work that we're doing. Um, and so we try to encourage that. I encourage that with my team and saying, you know, there, people are donating their times and, and donating their talents uh, to the institution. We should be doing the same in our community. So I encourage every member on our staff to be a part of another board or a part of their community and hear other voices. And so it's very important. You have to walk the walk and talk the talk. And that's what we try to do at our institution. Great. Megan? Yeah. I talk also about the neighborhood stuff you do. Sure. Uh, so I also felt the weight of it. I'm the eighth head of Lincoln Park Zoo, and we've been around since 1868. So wow. you can do the math. But people come to Lincoln Park Zoo and they stay. So my predecessor was there for 46 years. There was someone for six months in between. And then the predecessor before that was there for 46 years. So there's a long, I know, I've already heard that from my board. <laughs> um, I would like to retire at some point. Um, but uh, it is a big wait. Um, we are you know, a free cultural institution, and so we feel that profoundly. Our tagline is for wildlife for all, and so we really try to figure out how we can really, in Lincoln Park, we're located in Lincoln Park, we are a location, but how can we live our for wildlife for all across the city of Chicago? And so since 2017, we've been co-creating um, programs with some community partners. We uh, decided that we were going to invest in specific communities for the long haul. So we started in Little Village, and we said, we're here in Little Village. We had um, the philanthropy in Chicago is amazing. I'm originally from Atlanta, again, a city where people come in. You don't feel the same. It's not the same experience in Atlanta as it is here in Chicago. People are very invested. Um, but we decided that we wanted to sit in Little Village for a year and have staff there and not do anything but just listen. So we listened for a year with community members. And then we started to propose where we saw overlap or where we could create something new together. And so we started co-creating programs in Little Village and we did a lot of work with Open Center for the Art and Latinos Progresando and, um, and some community gardens. And then we actually got approached by North Lawndale who said, I see what you're doing in Little Village, would you consider doing North Lawndale? And so we went to North Lawndale and we were there for a year and then we started working with the North Lawndale Employment Network and um, I'm blanking on, uh, we created uh, Douglas 18, which is a miniature golf course out of um, North Lawndale with a lot of partners. So we, we've been committed to Lati uh, uh, Little Village and North Lawndale since 2017, 2019. And now we just added Austin. And so we're continuing to our process of we're going to be there for the long haul. We're continuing with those partners. We're not going anywhere because we know that there's been mistrust, valid mistrust of cultural institutions coming in saying, I know what the program is. I'm going to deliver it at you and then I'm going to leave. And so we're not creating something that we're delivering at anyone. We're co-creating something together. Um, we just got a really amazing, I'm still 
on the high of it um, award from North Lawndale Employment Network for being their community partner that makes Amazing. North Lawndale work. And so um, we've been doing a lot of work with them and, and it's just something we're really proud of. Um, and also we know we're not gonna be able to be in every single community because we have to be there for the long haul. So we're not going to spread ourselves too thin, but um, yeah, we're in those three part yeah. communities right now. All right, terrific, thank you. All right, who's got a question in the audience? All right, we'll go here first, then we'll go. I'm just going to do a mic for you real quick. Can you hear me? Okay. When you have vision sessions of all of you, when you have that kind of, what are we going to do for strategy, where do you ever take someone from the very extreme other industry, bring them in to give you different ideas or different thoughts or different innovation coming from a very different part of the world? A world in sense of industries? Uh, sometimes. The visioning sessions that I were describing were typically our own team, but we do audits of our departments occasionally, and we'll bring, like, we just did an audit, gosh, I, I say just, but I think it was 2016, <laughs> where we were looking at our um, conservation science department, and we brought in, I know, I know. I mean, we're all very long tenured yes. at Lincoln Park Zoo. Yeah. It's all relative. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, they came in, we brought scientists that work in conservation, we brought scientists that were in academia, uh, we brought scientists that were with NGOs, and they all came in and did an audit of what is Lincoln Park Zoo doing, and where do we think we could have an impact, and from their perspective, what were some of our greatest attributes, and what were the things that they might think we could do differently. And so we actually changed some of our conservation work as a result of of that program, um, of having them come in. But the visioning sessions that I was describing was really, you know, what would you wanna do? What would you wanna make a difference in? Our co-creating with community partners was a visioning session. And then we met with someone to ask them about becoming a, a, a philanthropist with Lincoln Park Zoo. And we were talking to them about conservation and they said, I'm really interested in what's happening in the communities in Chicago. And we had just had that visioning session, so we were just primed to talk about, this is what we would like to do, and they were excited about it. So, you know, it was it's also an opportunity to have some things in your back pocket that you'd like to do. Mm -hmm. We bring in, um, we brought in uh, different people outside of our field, but specifically I'll just name one, a uh, cultural anthropologist. and. Um, she actually was, uh, she's considered a futurist, and she talks about behaviors of humans uh, today and in the future. And so challenging us to think about who are we serving uh, 20, 30 years from now, where we're building exhibits, um, how do we need to think, who do we need to engage, and um, how do we have to disrupt our thinking and what we're doing. And this cultural anthropologist was the um, I heard of, heard of a small company called Intel. Um, Dr. Craig Barrett was uh, the CEO and I knew him in Arizona and um, he introduced me to her and she, gave, she was supposed to only give me 10 minutes in her green room when she was speaking to all the scientists at Intel and so I actually got 45 minutes, we became colleagues and so I had her come and talk to my team to disrupt our thinking. You know, just because we've been doing something one way doesn't mean we need to be doing it the other way. And we talked about, you know, the Generation Alpha. Right now, I mean, they are the first digitally native generation of our time. They're going to be the most racially and ethnically diverse generation of our time. And we need to be developing exhibits and experiences and get them inspired um, in the next 20, 30 years. So what we build today, if we think about today, it's already old. Is, is passe. So we need to be thinking about the future. And so we try to bring people in that pr provoke that innovation, that ideation, the creativity, and, and to drive our thinking to, to think different than how we think today, to actually develop new things. And it also gives us the opportunity and the breathing room to prototype and to have people um, try things, have people fail have people learn from their failures and to move forward. And then we bring people in to support that 
Um, so we're always looking for people to challenge us. And it's not the people in our field, because you can go to an annual conference and you talk to people and you hear the same things over and over again. It's about the people who are going to actually tell you the truth and tell you that you suck, tell you that you're doing real stuff really well, um, things you need to think about. So we're just open. Um, my team says, sometimes we feel like the punching bag. And I'm like, you know what? If we don't and we feel un if, we're, if we're not feeling uncomfortable, we're not growing. Yeah, I think you have to bring in outside thinking, and not for everything, not for every project, but um, the strategic planning process as an example, absolutely. Even if it's just facilitation, even if it's bringing someone in to really show you strengths and weaknesses, we run a, a program internally for employees called Outside In, both Betsy and Megan, and soon Chevy, I hope, will come as speakers, and the idea is bring the outside in, bring outside thinking in. I, I had the CEO, Christine Chevink, the CEO of Shore Microphones, um, who had never come to speak to us before, and she was talking about you know, the connection between Shore Microphone and Mozart and business. Like, it, just again, with outside thinking, you have to actually make sure that your people are getting insights from all over. And so industry, sometimes in the same industry, and sometimes completely different. Very valuable. Betsy, amazing. The panel, awesome. Megan, Sandra, and uh, Chevy. Hey, Chevy, very, very, not a lot of good knowledge. But I have a, a question for you guys. One or two opportunities in each of your guys' organization that is in the works, any project that you can you're working on or any exhibit that's coming up, something exciting, and maybe one challenge that you guys are going through right now, one challenge. Okay, one exciting thing <laughs> and one, just <coughs> shimmy it down to one exciting thing and one challenge. Go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, I, we're, we just finished our uh, new campus plan, and um, we're talking about what the physical campus of Lincoln Park Zoo might look in the next 10, 15, 20, 25 years. And so that's one very exciting uh, plan that would I could talk about it for about a couple hours. Um, but some of the things that we're talking about is kind of how do we flip the script on zoo inside out? So the things that you used to think of as being secretive or behind the scenes, how do we flip the script so that people don't, they know that there's nothing secretive happening behind the scenes? Because I think that's something that, that's a myth that's out there, that there's some secret things happening at the zoo and there's no, no, there's no secret thing. We're just trying to care for the animals the best way that we can. So that's one exciting thing. Um, one of the challenges I mean, I feel like there's a lot of challenges. I'll give you two. One is that we're really trying to figure out how to, um, we just talked, um, and I don't remember his name, Greg? Greg? Sam. Sam, we talked about, we're trying to figure out how to understand who's visiting Lincoln Park Zoo and where they're spending their time because we have over three million visitors every year. We have multiple gates and no one has to say anything when they walk in. And we have a whole portion of the zoo that is not fenced. So how do you count everybody that's in that space? And then how do you give them information about the animals that are in your care? And you know, the fact that everyone says, I had no idea about everything that I say that Lincoln Park Zoo is doing is something that is also a huge challenge for us. And so how do we meet everyone where they are at the zoo so that they don't have to say, I had no idea? I'd like people to say like, oh, I know, and I'm proud that Lincoln Park Zoo has all these scientists and I know they're, they're doing all of this work. So those are, those are my two examples. Yeah. Great examples. And I'll say meeting people where they are, that would be one of our challenges, right? So if you think about how you consume content, it has rapidly changed between streaming and iPhones and all of those things. We have to try and meet people where they are and make sure that our content is available. And, and I will say, you talk to a lot of media organizations and, and they can get a little territorial to say, well, we wanna make sure we, everybody's here and they watch this at this time. I'm like, we have to be where people are. So those changing media habits, that is the challenge that every single media organization, whether you're commercial, not-for-profit, small newsroom, large newsroom, everybody's doing that. So that is the biggest challenge. Um, and I would say also, you know, we have a specific focus on local, right? So the local, making sure that the local piece continues to stay important. 
Um, on the exciting front, I would say um, we have a program called First Hand. We're in our fifth year. Um, and we pick a topic every year. The first year we did gun violence. And we, we do a year-long initiative about what people who are experiencing those issues firsthand are going through. This year it's homelessness. And I will tell you, just being in the community, having people tell their stories, being across multiple platforms, being in the community, having speakers and TED-like talks in our studio, it's an exciting initiative. If you haven't seen it, I will direct you to the website. <laughs> Definitely have a look. Um, very exciting and a lot of collaboration from throughout the city of Chicago and community partner organizations. We can't do what we do by ourselves. And so that partnership and all of those partners in the community, they are invested in our success and we're invested in their success, so. Yeah. Awesome. Chevy? Um, the we have a couple of challenges. Uh, one of the challenges that um, is sort of in our face is nostalgia. People have been going to the museum for um, decades, 80, over 80 some odd years. And I can't tell you how many times I get uh, people in my face saying, don't you change that coal mine, <laughs> or don't you get rid of the baby chicks, um, or are you gonna be that CEO that changes everything. Um, <laughs> so yeah, that's a big challenge. Um, we got, we actually retired an exhibit. Um, it was a circus exhibit. I don't know if many of you saw that. Um, I cannot tell you how many hate mails that I got and emails about that. So change is, um, is something that is a challenge, but it's also an opportunity. And so we have, see, yeah, the airplane. <laughs> and so that's, that's a, that's a big, that's a big challenge. Um, and, but also it's an opportunity because we have over 1.3 million square feet of space. Uh, we just did a space plan and 35% of it is not used. So we have to reimagine that space and we sit on 30 acres. So we have outdoor and indoor and we're in a, over a hundred year old building. So um, that presents a lot of challenges. Um, another challenge, I'm just gonna go through my challenges. Um, <laughs> you know, um, before 1991, we were free, just like the Lincoln Park Zoo. We saw an average of 3.5 million visitors a year. And before 1991, we started charging in 1992 our tenants went to an average of about 1.2 to 1.5. So basically, two million people lost access to MSI, and we are on the south side of the city. What does that say to you? That says to you that accessibility is critical and it's really important. And so that's something that we're trying to address because if you ask anybody 40 and above, Oh, I love MSI. I was there for my first date, my first kiss, and I'm like, stop, I don't want anything else. <laughs> uh, my parents used to drop me off there. I mean, you hear all these stories. You ask anybody 40 and below, oh, I've been there, because there's no access. And so that's a huge problem in the community in which we sit and in which we serve. So that's a huge challenge, but it's also a huge opportunity. And so that's one of our BHAGs is making MSI free again. And that's something that's really important. So um, you asked what our successes Say are? So, what, are you, what are you excited about? What am I excited about? Change. That's what I'm excited about. There you go. I'm excited about change, about the exhibits, and about the programs, and, and all the things that are happening. We have a 007 exhibit that we're building exhibits that people from around the, actually around the world want to rent and they want to see. Um, we're bringing in digital technology, and we were a little, a little nervous about digital technology because we're hands-on didactic experiences. How do you meld that? Going back to that generation alpha, how do you produce those exhibits for 20 to 30 years, 30 years out? Those are some of the opportunities. So, um, yeah, opportunities and challenges, um, but every day is an exciting day. I have a fun little MSI fact that I just have to add <laughs> because... <laughs> WTTW in the 50s was an exhibit. 
at MSI. That's how it started. Before it was an independent television state, it was an exhibit at wow. the Museum of Science and Industry. And people ask where it is. <laughs> I'm sure people are like, what happened to it? <laughs> Don't change that. <laughs> All right, we have time for one. Well, okay, we're right here. Oh, you. I'm sorry. You got. So we'll go to you, and then we'll go to you, and then we'll come to me for the final, and then we'll uh, c convene. Okay, go ahead. Uh, so I've been in the museum multiple times. I love it, and uh, yeah, my favorite part is uh, pollutions, uh, the um, world po uh, world ocean pollution, and the other one is the Tesla thunder. It's really <laughs> cool. Like every 30 minutes, like I come back to see the thunder. And uh, my question is like, do we expect any new exhibitions? But you already mentioned it. And uh, other question, I also love the Lincoln Zoo. It's my favorite. Do we have to expect any new animals in the zoo? So some, anything new this year in the, this? Yeah. New animals and new exhibitions. How about animal babies? Yeah. Are there any animal babies coming? We're going to have a bunch <laughs> of new things going on. I don't know if many of you know, but we're going to have a name change, uh, our name change of our museum. Um, we also have a new um, digital experience called um, uh, Notes to Neurons, which talks about the brain, and it talks about how music impacts your brain, and it's gonna be an immersive digital experience, the first of its kind, so it's a prototype. Either we're gonna succeed or we're gonna fail, so come find out. <laughs> and um, we have, we're going to be redoing our rotunda, so you walk into our rotunda, you know the big circle where it says, science discerns the laws of nature, industry applies them to the needs of humankind. We're gonna actually, um, uh, what did our 20-year-old team member said? We're gonna. Uh, what did they say? We're gonna. We're gonna. We're gonna pimp it out. That's what they said. <laughs> so you're gonna see a pimped out, pimped exciting out. rotunda <laughs> experience where it's gonna be digital. We're gonna be showing stuff, and a lot of our young people are involved in helping to develop that. So it's gonna not look like your traditional landmark, beautiful marble walls and stuff. It's gonna be selfies. all like crazy <laughs> digital. It'll be fun. So please come see that. And in addition, we have a Dragon spacecraft capsule um, from a SpaceX. We're going to be opening up the Dragon space capsule. Is going to be opening up, and we're actually going to show it next to the Apollo 8 to show how technology is going. So there's a lot of cool stuff, and there's a lot of things down the pike. And yes, we are talking about um, uh, um, enhancing. That's a good word. Enhancing the coal mine and a number of other things. So. Uh, be on the lookout. That's part of our 15-year plan. So come see the pimped out rotunda. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any little babies coming? <laughs> or so. Uh, I will just say that we host the Population Management Center for all the zoos that are accredited in North America. And they are literally the match.com for all the zoo animals. So they're the population <laughs> biologists that say who should breed with whom and who should not breed with whom. Um, so we have a lot of breeding recommendations, uh, and I'm trying to think who has a short enough gestation period that they might <laughs> have their babies this year. Uh, we have a breeding recommendation for our snow leopards. They're super into each other. Um, <laughs> they're really, really into each other. If you've seen them when they're not together, because they're not together when they're solitary in the wild, and so sometimes we have to separate them, but they definitely are into each other. <laughs> um, so I don't know if they're going to have cubs, but they have a breeding recommendation. Our red pandas have a breeding recommendation. I know our rhinos have a breeding recommendation, but they uh, have a 13-month gestation period, so nothing will happen with them. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, there's a lot of animals for me to go through in my head. Uh, but we do have a lot of breeding recommendations this year, and we will announce those. I will say one of the things that's kind of exciting and a little bit challenging at the moment is that we have a lion cub who just turned one, and he was born with some issues in his spine. So one of his rear legs wasn't working quite right when he was very little. And then over the course of the year, he actually blew out a disc. And so we just did the first surgery, That's spinal good. surgery, on a one-year-old lion cub. He's actually doing really well. His name is Lomilock. Um, and so we will have 
four lion cub males that are going to be separated from the dad and the three females because the dad is kicking the other boys out because they're starting to show interest in their mom and their aunt in a way that he doesn't like. <laughs> and so we're going to have, hopefully, Lomilok's going to be coming into that pride and we'll have the four lion cubs and then the male and the three females. So that'll be also fun to watch. And mm -hmm. these four boys, they are fun and rambunctious, and they don't care that Lomi Lock has a blown disc. They'll jump off that <laughs> high rock right onto him, and he gets right into the mix, so yeah. As boys do. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Hi, my question is more on a personal level rather than an organizational one, but um, I call myself a recovering perfectionist, and I think that women in our society often have a lot of messaging that they have to be good girls who are perfect and do well, and obviously you guys are all extremely successful women. Um, and Chevy, you're talking about failure as this really positive thing that you get change and innovation and like progress <coughs> from. Um, but I'm still working on my relationship with failure, and I think a lot of people in the room probably are as well. Um, so would love to hear your perspective on that. Like how, how do you, yeah, uh, think of failure and be okay with it, welcome it, and recover from it, all of that. Well, I have a Sorry. personal story. Right. Um, when I was seven years old, um, my mother sat me down and she said, you've got st two strikes against you. You're a woman and you're black. So you need to perform at 200%, so you have 100% in your back pocket when you need it. And I lived with that, and I grew up with that, and always there was no room for error. It was perfection. It was always I didn't look the part. Um, you don't have the pedigree. Um, uh, looked over for promotions, and I had to work hard and harder than most. So when I decided to, when I moved into a leadership position, um, I decided I'm going to make this um, uh, comfortable and, and, and accessible for everyone and created opportunities for failure, created opportunities for people to not always be perfect, um, opportunities and support and by giving resources out professional development to my team to build and grow so they would not have to go through the challenges I had moving up my career. And so, um, um, you give what you get, and you pay it forward. And so that's um, how I dealt with it and how I still deal with it. And I still, even today, get questioned about the work. But I don't, I don't look at that challenge with adversity anymore. I'm comfortable and I know who I am and what I can do, and I hire awesome people that work with me as a team because we're one team. And so um, I would just say um, keep working at it, but when you get in that position, make sure that you make it better for others and you pay it for it. Yeah. I, <laughs> I, I would add to that as well that um, it's when you fail, that's when you learn the most, right? If, if you don't fail, you don't grow, you don't learn. and. I have to remember that and actually talk to my kids about that, right? And so, you know, especially teenagers. I have two teenagers. So you have to sort of remind them that that's when they, because they're going to fail. Everybody's going to fail. And so it's those little lessons that you have to continue to pull out and say, what have I learned from this experience, right? And, and I believe in lifelong learning. I believe that none of us is ever done. and. It's, and it's, it doesn't have to be a giant failure. It could be a little thing. Little failures, like, oh, okay, now I know what to do differently next time. So I would say, you know, give yourself some grace. Do not expect perfection. <laughs> it is the failures that make life even more rich. So that's what I would say. The opposite of a mom. My mom was a director of a preschool, and if you ever are around preschool folks, they believe in doing everything just in the craziest way sometimes. The more creative, the better. And so my mom was a big believer in like, 
imagining all sorts of things. And she would be the mom that was like skipping in the mall when you're a teenager and you're like, this is the worst thing possible. <laughs> But um, I think because of her freedom of like, she just wanted to be her, I really kind of developed a mantra of like good enough. And I do think a lot of people focus on like perfection, but you're never gonna move forward if you're like analysis paralysis. And I see that on a lot of my team. And so I spend a lot of my day saying to people like, good enough. Good enough because if we could we could run these stats seven thousand different times, but if we've got good enough data, let's start moving forward. And then if we don't like the way it's going, guess what? We can change. So you know, I think a little bit of it is as they've said, like you have to support people and say you messed up. Okay, great. Let's we learned that from this. Let's go in a different direction and make sure that people understand it's a culture where you can mess up but then also reminding people that sometimes good enough is good enough, and then go, go. Yeah. I think both of those are all great. My guess is that you still have moments where all three of you have sort of looked in the mirror like, you know, like you've had tough moments, like you, you can put yourself in her shoes at some point in time, whether you're a perfectionist or not, and be mm -hmm. like, yeah, I have to pump myself up sometimes to keep going, right? There are moments of doubt, or at least I've had moments of doubt, my guess is. And it's not just your own doubts, right? It's, it's community expectations, it's expectations from your employees, it's cultural expectations, yeah. right? I'm, I grew up in a Latino household, yeah. so it's, it, there are cultural expectations. Like, all of those things have to factor in, and then you have to sort of pull aside and say, what do I think, Yeah. right? So you, otherwise, you're a sort of slave to everyone else's expectations, and you can't operate that way. <laughs> I can't operate that way. Yeah. All right, you ready for the final question? This was not one I give in the, in the prep, <laughs> and I do it on purpose. Okay, <laughs> so I know it's April 2nd, but I want you to pretend like it's, like it's December 31st, all right? And you're, you're hanging out with your family or your friends or some combination, and you are reflecting back on calendar year 2024. What do you hope to be celebrating? I hope my daughter has figured out what college she wants to go to. <laughs> yes. And I hope that I am not traveling around to look at more colleges, <laughs> which I did last week. Um, I hope we're starting a new campaign for the zoo to move forward with our strategic plan and our campus plan. And gosh, I really like three, so hold on a second. Yeah, I do too. Um, your kitchen remodel? Um, I really hope <laughs> my kitchen remodel is done, and I hope my son is a little bit more, he's been a little up and down recently, and so I'm hoping that he's gonna start moving just a little bit more upwards. Yeah, that's what I would say. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome, Sandra? Um, let's see, I, I think coming out of these last few years, I hope that 2024 is one of those years where I feel like we've truly come back to interpersonal connections. And I don't just mean like going to events, right? I just mean like real conversations, real collaborations with people you like and projects that you're excited about. And so I would love to be able to look back on this year and say, you know what, we did things that not only that we were excited about and really wanted to do, but had an impact, right? And so. We're planning for that, and we're on a fiscal year, so it's June to, or July to July. Yeah, so we we'll be too. halfway You're through. In your fourth our, quarter. Yeah. Yes, we'll be halfway through our, our year, but you know, at least at least you know where you're going, yeah. and you are excited to get there. And everybody's sort of going in the same direction, and I feel like we've been heading in that direction. But I want to be able to look at that and say, look at all these great things that we did that actually had an impact, and. I feel like we're doing that, but I'd love to just continue to, to do that and, yeah. and have people be excited about it. Great, awesome. Chevy? On a personal level, um, I would just say that uh, at the end of 2024, um, I hope my grandson still says I'm his very, very best friend. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that would be the first thing, Miles, because he tells me every day, Tutu, he calls me Tutu, uh, it's Hawaiian for grand, grandparent. It says, Tutu, 
I want to go see Engine 999. I want to go see Zephyr 111 through the museum. I want to see everything. And so that's really, you know, the as part of that back to that DNA that it, that I want every person in the museum to feel that same way and to feel that same spirit and that same inspiration and fun. Um, so that's what I hope for 2024 um, for myself and for the museum. Um, I just want to meet our goals and I want to surpass them. Actually, I want to surpass our goals and um, I want to reach our, uh, our third year of our 15 year plan. And we have a lot of cool stuff coming. Um, I want to get a Saturn, Saturn rocket and I want to develop the human space exploration gallery. So I want to change things, but I also want to be respectful of nostalgia. Coal mine. <laughs> Just in case somebody's going to tweet that, right? You want to make sure that it's out in the public domain. <laughs> All right. Um, before, I don't want you to get up and race, uh, race away right uh, immediately because we're going to thank them. But before you get up, I have a tradition. Many, some of you know, Lori, other people know, I do a selfie on the stage with my guests. I'm not great at taking selfies, so it might take me just a second or two, but I want you in the background of the selfie, so I want you to be cheering, et cetera. So we're gonna, you're gonna, we're gonna thank them, that we're gonna take the selfie, and then after we've done the selfie, then you can get up and get your drink and your, and your food, all right? We got a deal? All right, th please thank my guests up here for their wonderful conversation.